Thanks, Simon. That's that's great. So um, well done, everybody. This is the fourth session. And in many ways, this is the final session. Although I'm preaching on Sunday at your church, that's going to be more of a kind of a, a sermon. And it won't be so much teaching. It will be simply uh, a shorter message in the context of, 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 of public worship. So in one sense, today is a final session of the, of the main teaching material. And just to recap where we have been um, over the last few weeks. Um, so the very first session, which seems a long time ago now, uh, we, we, we looked at um, knowing Jesus in his Jewish context. I mean, hopefully what we all want to do is to love Jesus more and to understand him better. That's part of being a disciple of Jesus. And part of understanding and loving Jesus is to understand his Jewish context. That's not the whole story, but it's a very important part of the story of Jesus. So we looked at the Gospels and we hopefully saw how clearly it stated in the Gospels that Jesus is rooted in his Jewish identity and in, in a Jewish context. And then we went on to the second session, which in many ways I think was perhaps the hardest session. I don't know what you felt really, but perhaps in one sense we covered a huge amount of ideas and areas in our second session. But the question really was, OK, if the early church is following the Jewish Messiah, if the early church is following the Jewish Jesus, uh, and many, many Jewish people said yes to Jesus, how come then the church is so different from what we would call rabbinical Judaism? There was obviously some kind of divorce, some kind of parting of the ways between the rabbinical Ju Judaism and the early church. Why did that happen? How, do, how would we explain that? Um, is that the end of the story? Is there going to be some future coming together in the in the future? So that's what we were looking at in the second session. So it was sort of historical, uh, covering a huge period of time, beginning from the New Testament right up into today, looking at that relationship between rabbinical Judaism and Christianity and how both relate back to biblical Judaism. So that was kind of a, the second session. And in the third session, which is actually on Holocaust Memorial Day, we looked at some of the theologies which the church has had to try and understand how the church relates to Jewish people and relates particularly to Israel. And we talked about a couple of theologies which I was suggesting to you, I believe, are heretical. They fall short of what God's word teaches. The first is something called replacement theology or supersessionism. For some of you, you'll know lots about those things. Others, it will be a new term. But we looked at where that came from and some of the weaknesses in that. And then we also looked at something called dual covenant or two covenant theology. And again, we looked at some of the weaknesses in that. And I suggested a new way forward, which I called enlargement theology. So in other words, the promises to Israel are not replaced by the church, but these promises are enlarged through Jesus's death and resurrection. And we can, if, if we are Gentiles, we don't have to become Jewish to follow the Jewish Messiah, but we have to put our faith and trust in him. So we looked at how uh, the different theologies are at work. And I suggested that replacement theology can often lead to anti-Semitism. And uh, we then made a little detour in looking at what anti-Semitism is, where does it come from? A little bit of the anti-Semitism in our own nation uh, through the history of, of England. And then finally, we looked at how we can resist anti-Semitism from taking root in our lives or maybe in our church or in our community. So that's what we've been doing over the last three weeks. And then there's been a chance for you to come back with some questions and insights as well, which has been good. But today we're looking at the final part in this, in that um, in 1948, um, some of you may have been alive then, I, I don't know if, any, if that's true for any of you, but uh, in, in, in recent history, let's put it this way, Israel was re-established as a nation. And I think probably um, as, as uh, from my understanding of, 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 of the Bible, that's you know, one of the most amazing um, historical facts of the 20th century, the re-establishment of Israel. Uh, you may think of other great things which have happened more recently, you know, the, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the end of apartheid in South Africa. There's lots of things you might think of, but I would suggest that in terms of significance, 
the re-establishment of Israel as a nation is theologically by far the most important thing uh, uh, in, 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 in recent history. So I want to look at why I think it's important and what are the implications for us as Christians? How should we respond to um, the re-establishment of Israel as a nation? So that's what we're going to be looking at. I hope to speak for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we'll, we'll hopefully have some time of questions and comments from you. So if I just move on to the next slide, I want to give a brief overview of, of um, Israel as a nation. So I want to start by looking at Jeremiah 31, 31 to 40. Now, if you've got a Bible, you may want to follow this to make sure I'm not making this up. But uh, um, really, Jeremiah 31 is often taken as a key chapter in Christian Jewish relations because this is where um, the Bible talks about the new covenant, which is to come. And uh, uh, as Christians, we believe that new covenant was made by Jesus when he shed his blood and he gave his life upon the cross and when he rose again. So this is really important uh, passage in, in, in the Old Testament. And it begins in verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Um, so up, up to this point, there's been a number of covenants God has made. First one uh, with Noah, which is a covenant with the whole of creation. And then a covenant with Abraham, and uh, really beginning in chapter 12 of Genesis and chapter 15 are the key chapters there. And we'll look at chapter 12 in a moment in Genesis. And then we have the, the covenant with Moses the, and the giving of the law, the Torah in Exodus. And then we have the covenant with David. So those covenants were firmly established. Uh, but here in God's word, the prophet Jeremiah says, yes, those, prof those covenants are great, but it's going to be a new covenant to build upon those covenants. And we really see in Jeremiah 31, this, this incredible new covenant, which God is going to bring into place. Um, but within that covenant, I think what often Christians forget is also the promise in verse 36 and again in verse 40. But in verse 36, it says, um, Israel, Israel will never cease being a nation before me. So, so some people say God's doing a new thing in the new covenant. So all this stuff about the covenant with Israel or the promises of the land made in Abraham will be replaced. They won't, they won't imp be important in the new covenant days. But even here, when the new covenant is spoken about, verse 36, gives a very clear assurance that the nation of Israel will never cease before the Lord. And again, there's a promise of uh, a restoration at the end of the chapter there. And it talks about the city, the holy city, never again being uprooted or demolished. So in this passage where there's that great emphasis on the new which is happening, Jeremiah is also saying to his readers, but don't forget, God will remain faithful to Israel as a nation and to the city. And there's something permanent the new doesn't replace what he's already given to you, given to us. So I think that's re really in, in, important there. Um, I suppose a question you might have is, well, if Israel will never cease to be a nation, but there were times when Israel were, you know, was in exile. There was times Israel was scattered. In what sense did they cease to be a nation at that point? But in God's eyes, even when they were in exile, they, they were still a nation in his eyes. And while they were scattered, there was equally the promise that that which could be scattered would be gathered and that which was exiled could be returned. So while it's true to say there was long periods when Israel was not in their land, it didn't mean that the promises of Israel and the nation um, were in some way forgotten. They were still you know, absolutely crucial to God. So it may be a bit like, I mean, any analogy is a bit kind of shaky in a way, but it might be like you own a house somewhere, but for many, many years, you never lived there. You, you, you moved to another country, but you kept the deeds at that house and you may have rented it out. You may have had our families living there and, and raising their children in your house, but the house still belonged to you. 
even if nobody from your family had ever seen that house. So in a sense, Israel had always existed in God's eyes as a nation, although for long periods of history, they were scattered uh, and in exile. But the promise really begins about the nation back in Genesis chapter 12. And there's a promise there of a blessing. And if you read on in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, you will see how that promise about the land develops through the covenant with Abraham. Um, you know, there's a promise of a people and a land, which is a kind of faithful promise of God. Sometimes a promise is given which is dependent on your response to that. So um, you might say to your children, you know, I, I promise to take you to Disneyland if you do really well in your exams. OK, so there's a promise but it's dependent on a response. Uh, and that's a bit like a contract. If you do this, I'll do this. But a covenant with Abraham like this is not based on Abraham's response apart from his faith. The, the, it, this is what God will do. This is God's honor and God's uh, unequivocal promise uh, to, to Abraham. So I think it's, 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 a, it's a covenantal promise, not a contract. Um, so I think that's a kind of uh, important distinction. So the Bible makes it clear that through the call of Abraham, um, the people of Israel begins as a family, uh, Abraham and his immediate descendants, and then they become a tribe and then they become a nation. So we can see that growth. And the story of Genesis really is just focusing on the immediate family, Abraham, Isaac, and then the next generation, Jacob. But by the time they're in Egypt, the, 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 the community has expanded and uh, they become like a nation, uh, a, a, a very big group of people. And it was the growth of the Israelites in Egypt, of course, if you know the story in the Exodus event, which actually made the Egyptians increase the oppression upon them because there was a fear that they, the Israelites would become the majority. They would become powerful enough to overthrow the Egyptian uh, their Egyptian masters. So there's, there's a kind of interesting element there. But after the Exodus event, Israel becomes a nation. Uh, they receive the commandments and they enter into the promised land, the land promised generations before to Abraham. And what they do in that land is they seek to be uh, a nation under God, living according to God's standards. And sometimes those standards are fulfilled and there's a blessing upon them. At other times, there's a judgment upon the people. Um, and uh, you can tell that story throughout um, the pages of the Old Testament. And there's a very interesting moment, for example, in, in 1 Samuel 8, verse 5. So the nation is now in the promised land and uh, God is speaking to them through the prophets. And Samuel is one of the, the early prophets in, in the Old Testament. And it's, it's interesting that the people come to Samuel and they ask him, um, in, they, they ask him in, in chapter 8, verse 5. So all the leaders, elders of Israel, gathered together and, and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead over us such as all the other nations have. So Israel at this point is distinctive from the other nations, but they see how the other nations are ruled. There's a kind of uh, uh, a king, a powerful kingly leader, maybe through a family dynasty or, or may not be a family dynasty, but there's a king and there's a clear leader. But that wasn't the way it was supposed to be for the Israelites. They were supposed to listen to God and God would speak to them through the law and the prophets. They weren't supposed to be, were they, like the other nations? So one of the great questions, really, um, which you may want to ponder uh, in, in the weeks ahead, is this, really. You know, was it right for Israel to have a king? Um, and it seems to be that uh, from the initial reading or Samuel's initial response was that he knew giving the nation a king was not God's perfect will for Israel. But as you read on in the story, God allowed it to happen. And some good came out of that as well as some bad. 
But I think for us as Christians, we understand there's a difference between what is God's perfect will and what God's permissive will allows to happen. So, for example, you know, it, God may well allow you to, um, you know, take a certain career path and there may be some good and some bad things which come out of the choice you made. You know, he's permitted you to do that. But his perfect will was something different to that. And maybe you never was able to fully discover that because you chose something which was permitted. Not it wasn't necessarily sinful. You know, you didn't choose to be, you know, a terrorist or whatever. You, you know, but you, you, it, it was something was permitted, but not perfect for you. And, uh, and I think that's the way most Christians understand the king, that, that, that the king was appointed. God allowed it to happen, but it wasn't his perfect will for the nation because he wanted the nation to demonstrate his righteousness and his rule and in some sense not to be like the other nations um, and I suppose at the heart of Jewish identity is this desire to remain different in order to honor God in order to demonstrate God's law and God's ways so one of the great fears in Judaism today of course is that people will assimilate into the surrounding culture and uh, will lose something of their God-given identity. And we, we can see that back in 1 Samuel 8. We want to be like the other nations. And, uh, and obviously, eventually, Saul, David, Solomon, and we have that tradition of, of the kings. And perhaps at the high point of the nation in Old Testament times was under Solomon, uh, we have the great building of the temple. And the nation of Israel was probably at its biggest, in terms of geographical reach, we have the tribes of the north and the south at that time. And, and there was clearly a blessing on, on Israel. And we can see the wisdom of Solomon, but also we see the oppression of Solomon. I mean, in, in what sense was Solomon a good leader or a bad leader? I mean, again, we, we could see examples from scripture, things we would applaud and things we would be uh, shocked by, by Solomon. So there's, there's a kind of mixed picture. And following uh, the reign of Solomon, of course, there was a time of division, um, the northern tribes going into exile, a time of occupation by the different groups. And eventually, of course, the tribes of the south, Judah, tribes in the south, were also taken into occupation. And I think in most cases of all other nations, when there's been that time of division, exile and long term occupation, the, that nation ceases to exist somehow it, it, it is lost and there's numerous examples of nations which are no longer uh, you know there's no trace they, they no longer have any connection with with the world today um, but there's all, always I think a God-given longing in the heart of exiled Jewish people for a return to the land um, even when they were you know thousands of miles away um, uh, so the psalm which I'm mentioning there is one which you, you will probably know well and it might remind you of, of a, a song. Some of us of a certain age will sing the Boney M version of this. But by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. So there they were on the, on, on, by the rivers of Babylon and they're remembering Zion. Um, and... Of course, we know from uh, Jewish tradition and the New Testament as well, that when there is no synagogue, where do Jewish people meet to worship? They meet by a river where there's running water. So the mikvah, the washing can take place. So I think here by the rivers of Babylon is not just a geographical reference. That's where we are. But it's also a spiritual reference. We're here in a context of being a worshipping community. There's no synagogue, but we're here by the rivers and we're remembering Zion. And remembering, I think, is more than just nostalgia. Wouldn't it be good if we could be back where we were? And we might have nostalgia for the past, but this is more than that. Remembering is remembering God's promise. God's promise that the nation would never cease to be a nation. Knowing that God has promised, you know, the dry bones can be brought back to life and the nation can be gathered. So really remembering is saying to God, it's reminding God of his promises. And saying, please, Lord, may this be the time when you remember Zion and you restore Zion, you restore the land.
So that's rooted there in, 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 in Jewish identity. And of course, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, um, just before uh, the ascension of Jesus, following his resurrection, he spends some time um, with his disciples. There's about 120 disciples at this point with Jesus. And they gathered around him. And of all the questions they could have asked, they asked this question. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, are you going to rise up Israel as a nation again? Is another way of putting that question. You know, how can it be, Jesus, that you are the resurrected Lord and these Roman soldiers are still in control? What's going to happen? You know, is this the time? And, uh, of course, Jesus, you know, um, says the time now is the time to focus on mission. You're going to go out with the gospel. Uh, but, you know, I think the legitimacy of that question is not is not denied by Jesus. He simply says this is not the time for that. But, but, but I think the assumption is a time will come when Israel will be restored as a nation. Um, and then, of course, in um, the other scriptures I've given you there in Zechariah and Ezekiel 20, we have those promises of that God will restore Israel as a nation. Um, I'm just going to read you those two verses from Isaiah. Um, and uh, again, you know, if you know your Bibles well, you know that you could put a list, a, a much bigger list than this. But I've just chosen a couple of highlight verses for me. Um, but uh, Isaiah 49 verse 6 says this. He says, it is, too, it, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring those of Egypt I have bring those of Israel I have kept I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth so in Isaiah there's that understanding that the tribes of Jacob will be restored to the land but in that there's a purpose namely that the light for the Gentiles the light for the nations will also learn from that so the restoration is not an end in itself but it also has a purpose that through this, people will see, the nations will see what? They will see the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the trustworthiness of God. And then in Isaiah uh, 66 verse 8, uh, there, there's an interesting kind of question. And uh, uh, the, the, the question is, uh, can a country be born in a day? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, Israel was born on uh, in May uh, 1948. So can a, can a nation be born in a day? Isaiah 66 verse 8. Um, the answer is yes. Yet no sooner is Zion in labour that she gives birth to her children. So there is this fulfilment uh, of, of scripture and I believe and many Christians believe that those promises of restoration were fulfilled in part in 19. 48. So that gives an overview of, of that hope uh, of Israel's restoration as a nation. So let's just go to the next slide, Simon, and then um, so that gives a bit of an overview of where we're going and what's happened in the Bible. So from the past to the present. So after um, the exile, after the Roman occupation, uh, the people became a scattered and persecuted people and uh, the Jewish community was spread really into almost the four corners of the world. In some places they prospered and were protected, other places they were persecuted and they suffered greatly and uh, a very very mixed picture. Um, but certainly when CMJ was starting working in the 19th century um, we went to almost every Jewish community throughout the world and we had a mission station and there was over 90 mission stations in different nations or parts of different empires. And I think that gives you some idea of the extreme diversity of the Jewish life at that time. Um, um, we've even got some old Torah scrolls which are written in Chinese. Um, there's a strong Chinese community. Of course, you may have heard of a strong Ethiopian community. Um, 
If you ever have a chance and you're in Jerusalem, go to the National Israel Museum and they have a whole floor of the museum and they have reconstructed, it's a very wonderful display, they've reconstructed synagogues from all over the world. And there's, there's, there's a rebuilt synagogue from Sudan, from India, from the Philippines. Uh, you know, and, and every sort of synagogue has that cultural style of you know, um, the area they're from, but also something distinctively Jewish. So the community has been scattered, um, but there's always the hope that one day, one day, the Lord would restore his people. Um, and I think that hope of restoration begins to reawaken in the Christian world after the Reformation. For probably 1500 years, that hope, uh, apart from a few individuals, was really completely dormant. You know, there's, there's nobody talking about these things. There's nobody praying about these things. There's nobody preaching about these things. But as a Reformation developed, um, I think Christians began to read the Bible in their own language and begin to see these promises. And a number of Christians, um, and often they're called restorationists, they were nearly always evangelical Christians, they began to believe that God would restore the Jewish people as a nation. Um, and sometimes this is called Christian Zionism. So it's motivated by a Christian reading of the scriptures and believing that God would restore Israel as a nation. And the implication is we therefore should do all we can to encourage and support that movement. One of the very early Christian Zionists was a guy called Lewis Way. Um, there's a biography of Lewis Way here, uh, which I like, if you ever wanted to get hold of this, is a really, really interesting story. Lewis Way is one of the most influential 19th century Christian leaders. But I guess, apart from a few people in, in this small world of Jewish Christian relations, nobody's ever heard of him. But he had the most amazing life and the most amazing person. And he was a real key person in this. Um, and Lewis Way was a very important supporter of CMJ, Church Administration Among Jewish People. Um, so I think for people like Lewis Way and many Bible-believing Christians in the 19th century believed that there was three things which were important in terms of loving Jewish people and serving Jewish people. The first one was evangelism, that we have a duty and a privilege to share the gospel with Jewish people. The second one is emancipation, that in most communities, Jewish people did, did not have the same civil and political and economic rights of other people. There was, they, they were in some sense treated as second class people. That is true in the Western world and also in the Islamic world. And there was a hope that Jewish people would be emancipated. They would have freedom given to them. Um, Lewis Way played a really big part, not just in evangelism and restoration, but also in emancipation of Jewish people. Um, and the third part of that was restoration, that Jewish people would, re would return to their land. So people like Lewis Way uh, were really key in that movement. And... We often talk about CMJ as having two pillars on which the ministry is built. One is evangelism and one is restoration. And, and, they, and you know, we, we see that in the history of, of the church's ministry around Jewish people. Uh, and I think you need both to have a firm foundation for your work. If you simply follow, focus on evangelism but without the promises the wider promises of God to his people, your evangelism will be will be good, but it's not the full picture. And if you're simply focusing on the restoring of Israel as a nation and praying for the land without a commitment to evangelism, I think, again, you're, you're selling short of what the Bible mandate is for you to do and for what it is for us to be. So um, there was this Christian Zionism, um, which probably was in, it, was in its heights in about the 1830s, 1840s. Later on, towards the end of the 19th century, there was a political Zionism, which was led by Jewish people. And the, perhaps the, the best known name of this, of course, is a guy called Theodor, Theodor Herzl. He was the leader of the Jewish Zionist movement and is really key to Israel becoming an independent nation in 1948. But I put in brackets there another name. Again, I guess nobody would have heard of this guy, William Heschler. But he was um, 
a really, he was a Christian, an evangelical Christian man, and he was a really good friend to Theodor Herzl. Um, and uh, there, there's times when Herzl talks about his life and really what he's saying, if it wasn't for William, I would have given up. Uh, William was, uh, was able to, I mean, Theodor was a Jew, uh, but he wasn't really religious. He didn't really know the scriptures very well. So here we have a Christian minister teaching a Jewish political Zionist about the promises of the land. And I think what Heschler did, again, I'm not, I'm not fully sure on this. Others may know more about this than, than me. But I think there was certainly a tendency when the Zionist movement became more powerful that they were offered land elsewhere. So, for example, there's talk of having an Israeli state in parts of South America and in parts of Uganda in Africa. But I think it was Heschler who convinced Theodor Herzl that don't settle for that. Um, hold out for your ancestral land. That is God's promise for you. So um, Heschler was an amazing person. Um, he's one of my heroes, really. He was a guy who, who kept going despite really difficult circumstances. He was a great Christian leader. He, he stood on the promises of scripture. He was a really close friend of Theodore Herzl. He was also very interesting. He was also a committed pacifist, uh, which is quite unusual in that context. Um, and during the First World War, he, he really um, advocated that the war should not happen. He was really distressed to see German Christians fighting British Christians. You know, he was just like, this is absolute nonsense. How could it possibly be that way? And there's a kind of jingoism in many churches, you know, but he stood against that. And he, you know, he, he, I, I think he was, he, he was uh, you know, a, 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 a pacifist in his understanding as a Christian. We may or may not share that view, but he was really, really heartbroken because before the First World War, there was an alliance between the Prussian and the British for work in the Middle East. They, they, they stood together. Um, so, and then um, in the late 1920s, he was one of the first people to speak out about the forthcoming Holocaust. He really had a, a ministry of prophecy and I think he could see what was happening and he pleaded and warned Jewish people to leave Germany. And uh, very few people listened to him. He, 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 he persuaded, he wanted to persuade the British government to open up uh, Palestine, which was under British mandate to give a home, a safe place for refugees fleeing Nazi Germany. Nobody listened to him. And uh, eventually he died in 1931, just when uh, the horrors of, of, of um, anti-Semitism in Germany and, and, and the first sort of avenues of, of Nazi power was being established. So he died in 31. He never saw uh, his dream come true, but he was someone who kept on going. And um, uh, he was completely forgotten, completely forgotten in, uh, in church and in Jewish life. Um, nothing really, nobody really remembered this, this great man until the beginning of the 20th century when people began to read some of the documents Many Jewish scholars, many Jewish politicians began to see how much Israel owed to Christian Zionists, people like William Heschler. And in 2011, I went to a cemetery in North London where Heschler had an unmarked grave um, and a group of Christians and Jews uh, erected a memorial stone to William Heschler. And there was prayers and a thanksgiving for his life. So one of the, one of the things I think, one of the qualities of a Christian is that he or she keeps on going, even when there's not much evidence of success. And Heschler is my example of that. Um, you know, um, you know he, he knew God's promise about Israel, but he died uh, just before the Holocaust took root and he was completely unknown. But I think it's so lovely that, you know, God raised up people who did honor him. And uh, I, I was there in 2011 when, when the memorial stone was dedicated to, to, to William Heschler. So we see this movement um, of political Zionism and Christian Zionism often wedded together, although they're different things, and a movement beginning to, to rise up for a Jewish state. I think in many ways the Holocaust creates an extra stimulus for that. Uh, as nations reflected on what has happened, this must never happen again. And there was an outpouring of emotional support for the Jewish refugees and, and momentum for Israel to become a Jewish state. And that happened, of course, through uh, the decision of the United Nations on the 14th of May, 
1948. So let's just move on to the next slide. So what about Israel today? Sorry, there's a, there's a spelling mistake, mistake on this one. I got my refuge and refugees mixed up. It's, it's, it, I'm thinking of the Jewish refugees coming out of Nazi Germany, survivors of the Holocaust coming to, to the Promised Land. But Israel today is really a refuge for Jewish people. Um, so wherever there is persecution, wherever there is suffering, Israel will guarantee a home for persecuted Jews from around the world. Um, for a, I had the privilege of, of actually doing some traveling in Morocco um, a, a number of years ago. And of course, Morocco was a very strong Jewish community, on, on, particularly up in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, many, many Jewish groups. But they were all expelled from Morocco, and there's, there's no trace of much Jewish life there now at all. And of course, throughout the Arab world, where there were strong Jewish communities, they were all expelled, and Jew Israel was able to absorb them back into Israel, often at great cost. It's, it's amazing, really, that Israel has been able to survive and thrive when there's been so many people pouring in who have been, you know, very close to destitution because of you know, they have been literally, you know, extracted from their homeland, from, from the lands they have been dwelling uh, and, and leaving with very, very little resources. And Israel had to welcome resource and help people re-engage with, 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 with Israeli society. And again, in more recent times, it's not from the Arab world, but it's, of course, it's from the former Soviet Union, where so many Jewish people have made Aliyah and have returned to, to Israel. Um, so, you know, in parts of Israel today, you're more likely to hear a Russian voice than a Hebrew or an English or an Arabic voice, uh, a huge percentage of, of Russian uh, Jews returning. So Israel today is important because it's, it's a refuge for Jewish people from throughout the world. And recently, for example, there's a, a number of horrible terrorist attacks in France. So Israel is significant because many Jewish people from France chose to make Aliyah at that point. Um, in, uh, so it's, it, it, it provides a safe haven, a refuge for Jewish people. It's also a context for a Jewish future that uh, Israel, with all its strengths and weaknesses, it is the main context for Jewish life. So what will the Jewish future be like? Well, you know, the context for that future will be very much shaped by the nation of Israel. And the other thing why I think Israel is significant is that it is um, a democratic, secular Jewish state within the cauldron of the Middle East. So in that sense, it's um, a beacon of hope in, in, in a troubled world. I mean, many people think Israel is part of the problem of the Middle East. And uh, you know that's been very strongly argued by many people. But for my reading of the situation, it's 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 really not it's it, it's part of the solution. It's not it's not part of the problem, and uh, and uh, uh, you know it, it is a democratic, secular Jewish state. The question is, of course, can it remain democratic, secular, and Jewish? Um, the 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 um, the simple uh, demographics now, with the growth among Arab Israelis, um, is so strong. You wonder at what point you can remain democratic and Jewish if the majority of people are not Jewish. So there's, there's a long-term issue there, but that's something we may want to discuss. But that's why Israel is significant. Um, it's, a, it's a safe refuge for Jewish people. It's, it provides a context for future Jewish life and is a democratic secular state within the cauldron of the Middle East. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, so what is it for the significance of this theologically. I think the first thing to say is that, you know, Simon chose those two lovely songs this evening about faithfulness. God keeps his promises. Um, how, how would you say God keeps his promises? Well, one example I think you could say, well, in recent history, we have seen the reestablishment of Israel as a nation. Things spoken about in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, in Jeremiah have come to pass. There's been this gathering from the four corners of the world and a returning to Israel. This is a sign of God, a, a promise keeping God. And I think that's a challenge to a replacement mindset. If you're a replacement theolog theologian, going back to the session uh, last week, they would say, well, all the promises about the land are irrelevant. You know, um, so 
Israel being restored is has nothing to do with God. It, it's it's come about by some strange sort of political processes, you know, some human decisions here and there, uh, you know, a bad decision of the United Nations. It, it has no significance. Now, I think you can say that, but really, as a Christian, if you're reading Scripture, what has happened, I think, should challenge that. If you're if you've got an open mind when you're reading the Scriptures, I do believe that. The return of Israel as a nation, the re-establishment of Israel, is a fulfilment of Scripture, and so I think that, and I think that's a challenge replacement theologians need to hear. It also provided, theologically, a renewed context for evangelism. And what I mean by this is that if you're part of a persecuted, scattered group, uh, a minority group, uh, you know, Jewish community in a largely non-Jewish world. What is important to you is to maintain your solidarity with your people. And the thought of becoming interested in the gospel or becoming a Christian is seeing that somehow that's a denial of your people. How could I possibly do that? You know, that, that would be impossible, that I, I would lose all my family and I'll be a traitor to my people. But if your Jewish identity is secure because you are living in a Jewish state, you, you may have served in the Jewish army. So your Jewishness is secure because of your national life. Gives you permission in many cases to begin to explore, you know, the gospel message. I think there's a far greater openness for Jewish people to engage with the gospel when people are back in the land and secure than when they're part of uh, a, prote uh, a, a defensive minority somewhere else. And... Um, in 1950, I think it was, CMJ gathered all the Jewish believers we knew in the land, and uh, there was about 50 people. They filled basically the downstairs library at our centre in Jerusalem. Now, obviously, there may be more than that, but you know, we were pretty confident that we got everybody together and, and people prayed and talked together. But but now we we, we believe that there's at least 40,000. I mean, again, the figures are debated by people, but I think it's a conservative estimate to say at least 40,000 people. And, uh, you know, they certainly couldn't fit into our library. So there's been, you know, over three generations, a growth of Messianic Jewish identity. And I do believe that has something to do with the security and the opportunities and the openness people have of being in their land. It, it opens up possibilities, which probably didn't exist before that. And it's certainly a renewed context for Messianic Jewish identity. Um, and I think um, uh, many people going back to the land are saying, you know, what, what is Jewish identity? Uh, you know, and, and I think um, there's many people now who are beginning to see the validity of Messianic Jewish identity. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's something which is a positive story there as well. So I think in terms of theology, God keeps his promises, it gives a new renewed context for evangelism, and it also helps for Messianic Jewish identity to flourish in, in some way as well. In terms of the wider end times perspective, um, Isaiah 19 talks about a highway which connects uh, Egypt and Syria or Syria and Israel. So somehow Israel being back in the land creates uh, a, sig a significant factor. Those, that, that end time picture of harmony and blessing between um, uh, the whole region is dependent on, on the existence of Israel. You could not really interpret Isaiah 19 in, in an eschatological sense before 1948, I believe. So something has changed. Uh, Romans 11, 20, 26 talks about all Israel being, being saved. And we, we can talk about Israel not just as different groups but also as a gathered nation. Um, in Matthew 24, the, the symbol of the fig tree re-blossoming um, is again, I think, a, a picture of the end times. And again, Israel being restored as a nation, many people see as a fulfillment of the fig tree prophecy, the fig tree metaphor in Matthew 24. Um, and there's many more examples. Let me just read one to you from, from Luke 21 and uh, we'll come into land after this one tonight. But Again, I think this, this is important. Luke 21, verse 24. Um, 
talks about this is a, about the destruction of the temple and the end times before the Lord's return. He says this, they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. This is a time of scattering. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles. And from the time of the Romans, we had oppression by the Byzantines, by uh, the Muslim groups, by the, uh, the Turkish uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, eventually came under the British mandate. But for nearly 2000 years, Jerusalem was ruled and in some cases trampled on by the nations until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled and there'll be that restoration. So, so I know that many people have very strong views on how all this would happen. We don't have a particular in CMJ, a particular eschatological view, but I think what we do have is a conviction that the restoration of Israel is a move of God. And that does have end time significance. And, uh, you know, there's lots of areas we can discuss around that. But I think that's why it's theologically significant. Um, and of course, if you want to do more work on that, in addition to those references, um, we would probably also want to look at the book of Revelation. Um, some of you may have heard of a guy called Eugene Peterson, and I'll finish on this point. Uh, he wrote, um, the, if you ever got the Message Bible, which some people like, that was his work pretty much. Um, but he's also written many things. He's a very good devotional to, uh, reader. If you're in Christian ministry or thinking about Christian ministry, the best book I think I've ever read on Christian ministry is called Under the Unpredictable Plant by Eugene Peterson. And what Eugene says there, which I think is very interesting, he says that there are certain books of the Bible which God rise, raises up at certain times in the history of the church. And he gives lots of examples. But one of the things he says, which I think is fairly obvious, during the Reformation, the key book was the book of Romans. It was Luther's commentary on Romans, really, which, which led to a, a rediscovery of justification by faith. Uh, Romans is kind of the book of the Reformation. But he's saying the book for the 21st century church must be the book of Revelation. Um, so, you know, I think that's really challenging. Uh, maybe, you know, you would like to do a study on Revelation, the book sometime. Uh, but I think I think it's uh, uh, a great challenge for us. But I think I think there's something important there. So I do believe the restoration of Israel is is a fulfillment of God's promises. And it does have theological significance for the church. And I think that's why I believe we're living in important times. And whatever you think about the end time scenarios, we're nearer to the end than when we began this 45 minutes ago. So have hope. Thanks very much. I hope some of that is interesting for you. And, and you may want to come back with questions. So thank you very much. Alex, thank you very much. That's another brilliant talk. Very, very interesting. Lots of uh, issues and things raised by that. Uh, I just want to give people an opportunity to ask any questions and jump in. And uh... sorry, no. Oh yes, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone has any questions? Um, yeah, feel free to raise them. I have a question. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I was, but while, I'm, while I'm asking my question, you can be thinking of your questions. <laughs> um, sorry, Nelly, what was yeah, it? Right. You're okay. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, sorry, is that, is that Vanessa? Were you going to say something? No, no, I, I was just saying to myself, I'm going all blank. I've got so many questions, but I've gone blank. So. <laughs> sorry about that alex that's all right that's okay sometimes we just need time to have a little thing don't we before you know and there's a lot to process there so, yeah. okay let me fire away with my question um you mentioned alex about the fact that there's um a yeah, lot it's of... very fantastic okay yeah. yeah a lot of jewish communities have um have have actually returned to the land of israel and and as part of the re-establishment of the nation but there's um a lot of people, a lot of perhaps as many Jewish people who don't live in Israel. Um, what do you think is the significance of that? And, and, you know, for all Israel to be saved, do they all have to be back in the land or 
can can they be won where they are, like in New York? And yeah, I, I think I think there's been a a significant growth in the percentage of Jewish people living in Israel. I, again, the figures are hard to be precise, but I think some people say there was a tipping point reached a couple of years ago when more than fifty percent of world Jewry lived in Israel. It's a bit complicated because some people have, you know, two homes and, you know, they, they perhaps have an identity back with the states and they're still in Israel or whatever. So it's, it's hard to be precise, but I think there's been a gradual growth. And I think many Christians are, you know, if you support uh, a ministry which is making Aliyah possible for people, I suppose you, your desire is to see many more Jewish people back in the land, especially if they're coming from areas which are persecuted. Mm -hmm. I think the difficulty, in a way, with that i mean i understand that i think that's got to be something which god does in his timing and if we can help in some way that's great but i i feel it can almost become a kind of reverse anti-semitism if we're saying to jewish people you must go back to your land i think in a sense that's something they have to discern is right for them and i particularly love having jewish communities in britain i think they enrich our lives so part mm -hmm. of me is thinking you know it, you know at, at what point am i torn on this particularly for Jewish believers, who I believe give so much power to the church in the UK, and they often help us in our witness to our Jewish friends and neighbours in, in, in the wider society. And of course, if you're a Messianic Jew, you probably cannot make Aliyah without denying Jesus. So that gets it more complicated. So uh -huh. I think there is something there which, which is of significance uh, in this. And so I think simply saying all Jewish people should go back to the land of Israel I think that's got to be nuanced quite a lot in what we're saying. But I think you're right, Simon. I think there is the majority now coming back. I think that is significant. But I think the important thing, I don't think for Israel to be saved, I, I think, you know, that can happen. Jewish people can be saved wherever they are. And the point is, for all Israel to be saved, there is a recognition of who Jesus is. And it seems to be that for Jesus to return in the place he left, the Mount of Olives, there has to be a community of Jewish people who, who welcome him back. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So I think there has to be uh, a resident, strong Jewish community in Jerusalem for the Lord to return. Um, but I don't think that means every Jewish person everywhere. And of course, you know, Jewish people are not saved by their postcode, but by their faith in Jesus. Yeah. So you, know, you don't have to be back in Israel to be saved. But I do think, and this is the point I made about one of the significant points, that I do think there are opportunities for evangelism which probably exist in the land of Israel, which don't exist in the dispersia, in, in, in the lands outside Israel. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think more Jewish people will come back to, to Israel. I think there'll be a high percentage but I think maybe for generations to come, there will still be strong Jewish communities elsewhere, enriching wider life. But, um, you know, we, that, that's sort of, in a sense, beyond our pay grade, Simon, I think, to, to fully <laughs> understand that. Absolutely. Amen. Mm. Well, it's only a finite amount of space anyway. Yeah, yeah, there is. But I suppose you're seeing also, um, you know, with technology, with irrigation and with, you know, building, you know, it's surprising how, you know, um, populations can grow on small islands, you know, and, but I agree. I mean, may, maybe, you know, I suppose it also depends on what is your view at the end times. I mean, some, I think people like Lewis Way and most Christian restorationists in the 19th century, sorry, I mean, Lewis Way was probably a bit unusual. He, he was something called uh, again, I don't want to necessarily open all this up unless you want to go down this route. But he he, he was certainly a premillennialist. That was his view. Uh, while most Christian restorationists in the 19th century were postmillennialists, so it's a very different timetable. Today, most evangelical Christians who support Israel are premillennialists. But it's not. You don't have to have that view to to believe. You know, 99% of what I've said today. Um, so, but if you're a postmillennialist you've got a much more optimistic view of mission, a much more optimistic view of, of, of what is happening. Um, may not make it right, but it's more optimistic. If you're a premillennialist, you're really fairly pessimistic. Um, that doesn't mean you're wrong. Can, can I just ask a question, please? Because, um, I mean, you can laugh if you want, but this is how I'm looking at you because I'm a bit confused. Um, 
the, the Jewish people. So their aim is, is the promise that, you know, they will one day return to Israel. And um, to us Christians, our promise is that Jesus will come back and, and take us with him to heaven. Yes. So are, are, there, are the Jewish people then, are, are they included? Well, I think they are, but learning this now, what is more important to them? Is it to return back to Israel or wherever they are to wait for the return of yeah. Christ? Okay, thank you. That, that's, that's a great question. And I, I wouldn't dream of laughing at that. I think that's really a really important question. And I think what, what the Apostle Paul said as a Jewish person who found Messiah Jesus, he said, compared to knowing Jesus as my Lord and Saviour, nothing else matters. In fact, everything else is really rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. So if I have a choice for a Jewish person to put their trust in Jesus or to make Aliyah back to Israel, it would always be to put their trust in Jesus. No one is saved by going back to Israel. But in God's purposes, people are coming back to the land as the first step in a further revelation to them. So yeah. if you believe one day all Israel will be saved, it's like, you know, what's more important? You know, having a primary school education or a university degree, you would say a university degree is more important, but you can't get that university degree unless you have a primary education. You, you've got to go through the process. So many people say, of course, the most important thing is for Jewish people to know Jesus. But how are they going to know Jesus? Well, it seems to be a promise that there'll be a restoration when they come back to the land. So coming back to the land is the first step, a very important step for coming to know the Messiah. So mm. you know, it's kind of connected. Um, and then, of course, there's that hope that all Israel will be saved when the Lord returns. There'll be that mass revival or, or mass uh, acknowledgement of Jesus and all Israel will be saved, however you interpret that verse 11 26 is clearly going to be great news and i think this is why i'm working among jewish people i want jewish people to be saved today i want people to hear the gospel and respond be it in israel or be it in in stanford hill or in cambridge you know i'm not bothered about that i want jewish people to say yes to jesus but i see as part of god's plan there is for many coming back to the land of israel is significant in 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 that process so i've got to try and hold those 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 things to, together um yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I think for us, our greatest hope is in knowing Jesus as Lord. And, you know, when we die, we, we are with him forever in heaven. And, you know, so, and that is far greater than returning to the land. But the returning to the land is still significant in God's purposes. And, I, and so I think you've got to hold that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of made sense when I was speaking, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Make a comment. This is Lillian. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine, Lillian. Yes. Lovely. There seems to be a fine line, like a tightrope, between um, large groups of Jewish people, like in Stamford Hill because they've been persecuted for so long, they tend to try to live quite close to one another, but they're becoming quite inward looking. And I think that's what is one of the causes of anti-Semitism, because people who are not Jewish want them to sort of turn around and become more like them. So it, it's not just a fine line, it's a tightrope. And they've had thousands of years, really, of, of being picked on and being persecuted. I th so that I think they feel like victims. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I, 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 I think what you get in, in Jewish identity i suppose is, is a kind of struggle between two main trends one trend of course is for assimilation so we'll be like other nations you know uh, and many jewish people would live their lives as jewish people but they are completely absorbed into the secular world and yeah. uh, and they, they, there's certain you know that there's a certain uh, drive for that to happen 
Mm. Um, in the more orthodox Jewish world, and of which many communities in Stamford Hill would belong to, there yeah. is a, a, a saying that the modern world is really bad news. Um, some of the rabbis from the orthodox world says the greatest threat to Jewish identity, um, guess what it would be? What, what if it might be the greatest threat to Jewish identity from the orthodox Jewish world today? Ooh. Something we're doing tonight. Mm -hmm. Social media and the internet. Many Jews said that will kill more Jewish people than the Holocaust spiritually. Wow. Because people will get ideas. Oh, if, you're, yeah. if, if, you're, if you're in a closed orthodox world, there's no, there's no um, education beyond the, the small world of Judaism. So people begin to have questions. They begin to see. And there's, there's, so, um, there's a closed world. And I think you're right. I think often a closed world can bring suspicion from other people. Mm. Um, so there are Orthodox Jews who, who have kept in very closed worlds for, for generations. And probably uh, post-Holocaust, that group has become more predominant, partly because small Orthodox communities, um, you know, have very large families. I mean, the, the women often are really baby machines from a very early age. So you've got demographics, you've got, so, you know, a liberal Jewish family may have 1.2 children or whatever, but in, in the Orthodox world, you know, having families of 10, 15 is, is, is not uncommon. So there's a democratic demographic shift um, among that. But of course, many of the Orthodox Jewish world are very anti-Zionist. They don't want to go back to Israel. No. Um, it, why? Because they believe um, the Israelis, only the Messiah can restore the nation of Israel. Um, and uh, therefore, there's a lot of anti, probably less so now, because the reality of having Israel as 70 years sort of changes your perception. There's a kind of pragmatic response to that. And, and many Orthodox communities have Bible colleges, you know, uh, yeshivas set up in Israel. So there's, there, there is a kind of engagement. But I think theologically, a lot of the early Orthodox Jewish communities were very opposed to Zionism because they saw it as a secular, often uh, very left wing Jewish ideology. And really, this is God's work. We, we should have no part to play in that. So it's, so it's a very mixed picture, really, in, in the Jewish world, as far as I understand it, the attitude to the state of Israel. Although I think more, there's more positive attitudes than there were back in, in the 1930s and 40s. Yeah. OK, but thank I, you. But I think, I'm sorry, um, I'm going to have to leave you because my son is trying to get through on Skype and it must be... Well, that's, that's, that's the dangers of the internet. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Bless you. But I think some Christians also had a similar kind of view about the, when, you know, the restoration of Israel. Some people felt what would have to happen first before Israel is restored in nation is for Jewish people to become followers of Jesus and then Israel will be restored. But it seems to be that what the scriptures are teaching, that people will be restored to Israel in unbelief and then they'll be coming to faith. So, um, you know, uh, so there was quite a bit of debate in Jewish, in Christian restoration circles about can Jewish people return en masse before um, they become followers of Jesus. And I think the answer is and was, it's on balance. People will return in unbelief, but they will find faith through the restoration of Israel as a nation. Mm -hmm. There are some signs of that, but, you know, there's obviously uh, a long, long way to go. So ah. Did you say earlier that you have to deny your Christian faith if you want to to return to Israel politically yes was that just to get the benefits from the state no I think I think the point was really who is who defines who is Jewish really and in terms of the Jewish as far as I understand it there's been a number of court cases and it's kind of the Jewish law has sort of changed a bit over time but as far as I understand it I'm not an expert on these things but um the Jewish um Orthodox Jewish world defines Judaism uh, in terms of having um, uh, a Jewish mum. I mean, biblically, it's a Jewish dad, isn't it? But you know, it's much easier to prove who your mother is than who your dad is. So it's 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 having a Jewish mother. But the exception is in Jewish tradition, if you've converted to um, 
to become a follower of Jesus, even if you're a Messianic Jew and you might be living a very Orthodox Jewish life. The fact that you have proclaimed Jesus is your Lord, that, that, that kind of makes you outside of what is acceptable to Jewish life. So, um, um, so a number of Messianic Jews or, you know, Jewish Christians, if you like, often if they feel called to make Aliyah, they have a very difficult choice. What will I say if I'm asked a direct question? I will not deny Jesus, but I'm not going to volunteer it. You know, I'm not going to. So, so the, we talked about walking a tightrope earlier. And I think a number of Messianic Jewish believers who feel they should make Aliyah do have extreme difficulties. We have a number of Jewish believers here who um, are very, very sensitive if you know in terms of appearing on the internet going to a cmj conference we we, we never take photographs of people uh, without their direct permission um you've got to be so careful on social media chit chat because there is a fear of being kind of outed now so so it's it is difficult but as far as i understand it you can be jewish um and you can be whatever you like you could be a jewish buddhist you could be a jewish a wizard you could be a jewish marxist you could be a jewish secular but you can't be a jewish believer in jesus and make aliyah and i think that does remind us of something very very powerful whatever other allegiances you have in your life have no power compared to claiming jesus is lord and that probably is a, so many messianic jews would probably love to make aliyah but they can't do it in the moment because they're not going to deny their faith in jesus so that's, that's a very interesting thing. And I would hope and pray that the Jewish state would recognize the validity of Messianic Jewish identity. Um, you know, if you're gonna, if you, if, you can, if you can acknowledge a Jewish person who is a Hindu, follows the Hindu teaching or is into the occult or is a secular Marxist, surely there's enough room to allow someone to say, I believe Rabbi Jesus is my Messiah and Lord. So, so I hope there will be that recognition, and, and maybe that will happen. It may take a generation to happen. Um, so, there, there, there are there are big issues there about that. Um, yeah, but uh, um, but there are, of course, you know, third or fourth generation of Jewish believers who have been in the land all the time, so that they are secure in the land. And of course, many Jewish people return in unbelief, and and they become. You know christians or messianic jews while they're in the land and and, and that's absolutely fine um and, and and the israeli state gives full freedom of worship to christian groups muslim groups messianic groups or whatever so so there's a freedom there um occasionally messianic jewish groups are oppressed by more orthodox jews um uh, and there's been some history of that which is very sad our center christ church Quite recently there have been protests outside the door banning and they're trying to trying to prevent jewish people coming into our buildings um so it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a complex situation well <clears throat> i'm aware of the time we're sort of coming to the end of our um allotted time for this um if you have any more questions i i encourage you to pass them either send them to me on email or i'll pass them on to alex or we can, um, we can, or, or indeed, um, perhaps there'll be one or two questions that could be put on Sunday, if there's time allowed. Um, so there, there are more opportunities for questions. Uh, but I'm Simon. Yeah, just to say, obviously, people can always, and, and if they visit the CMJ website, there's some questions and answers on there. I do a blog every month called the Romans 15A blog, which gives some of this teaching and some there's opportunities to ask questions there. And look, just to say, Simon, thank you so much for these four sessions. I hope, hope it's been good. I will look forward to coming on Sunday. I'm going to be teaching from Romans chapter one. So if, if you've got time, you want to read the first 16 verses of Romans one, that would be really good. And the other thing, Simon, just to plug, or maybe you want to mention this on Sunday, on the 16th of February in the evening, I'm speaking at the Hepzibah Group in Cambridge, which I think some of you may know of. Um, and I'm speaking there on getting to know Paul's letter to the Romans from a biblical Jewish perspective. Excellent. So um, so if you've been interested in some of this, that, that may hopefully also be helpful on the 16th of Feb. And if you listen to that, make sure you make a pancake for me. That's Tuesday. Thank you. Well, yeah, because it's Pancake Tuesday, isn't it? That's, That's right, right. Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness, it's coming on us already. <laughs> well. Okay, thank you, Simon. No, no, that is wonderful. Thank you. Look forward to that. <laughs>
Um, I was wondering if we could draw to a close. Um, Kath, uh, can you hear me? Uh, <clears throat> would, you, would you be able to pray for us <clears throat> if you just unmute your microphone? Would you be able to do that? I do, I've always felt that, Kath, you, you, you've been like a mother to the church, really, in the whole question of Israel. And, you, and uh, it would be wonderful to have you just pray for us if you were able to. I, I, can, um, anyway, I can ask you to unmute. Yes. Thank you. Lord God Almighty, King of the Universe, we bless you and forget not all your benefits. Father, we thank you for um, all that uh, we have heard tonight. Thank you for all that, um, all the questions. We thank you, Lord, that um, it that um, we love the Jewish people mm. and um, we we'll just pray that uh, for Alex as he um, goes home and is at home and uh, that um, we look forward to seeing him on Sunday. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, thank you, bless you. Well, say good, <clears throat> say good night to everybody, and I uh, hope you have a good night's sleep. And, and uh, good night. Lord thank you, you, Alex. Thank you. 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 Thank